Michael, tumultuous times in the Gulf, all of the Iranian proxies, uh, the assessment by U.S. intelligence that Iran was somehow wanting to keep a lid on escalation of the Gaza war beyond, and to avoid that, you haven't seen Hezbollah in a real, you know, a real uh, open front, opening a northern front, some of the other proxies as well. The influence on Hamas and what Hamas is going to do regarding the hostages. Yeah. What, what do you see happening as they pick new leaders? So the paradox here, Andrea, and thanks for having me on, is this is such a chaotic, dangerous time in the Middle East. Iran is at the center of so much of the violence uh, and conflict that we're seeing because of its sponsorship of Hamas, of the Houthis, of proxy militias in Syria and Iraq, which have, have attacked U.S. forces. Um, so you have all this chaos that Iran is helping to foment. And then you have this incredibly uh, disruptive, sudden uh, event with the death of Iran's president and foreign minister. Um, the paradox is that I don't think that much is going to change um, for a couple of reasons. One is that the real power in Iran is the man uh, I think you had on your screen a moment ago, uh, Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah right. Khamenei. That is not him now. Uh, but he is the man who really runs the country. And there's kind of a sham democracy in Iran where they do elect a president, but uh, those are elections that um, you know are widely discredited as illegitimate. Most candidates, uh, many candidates are disallowed from running. Um, and then beyond that, the second reason is that, you know, the entire political establishment in Iran, the, the establishment that really controls the country below the supreme leader, is made up overwhelmingly of hardliners. And it and by all accounts, it appears that the president and the foreign minister will likely be succeeded by like minded hardliners. But the last point, which is also sort of paradoxical, given all the instability in the reason, region, is that Iran has been limiting the escalation of these conflicts because it does not appear that Iran wants a full scale, full blown war with Israel or the United States. Now, of course, there's a huge impact on what's happening in Israel. Uh, the Hostage and Missing Families Forum yesterday released a really disturbing uh, video from October 7th. They wanted to release it to put pressure on for a hostage release. It shows Hamas terrorists on October 7th inside an Israeli military base with seven female IDF soldiers, many covered in blood and bruises. Well, I mean, it's just horrific. The soldiers are leering and saying uh, really provocative and, and threatening things to these women. The UN has reported that many of the of the women hostages were attacked sexually, and that rape was used as a weapon of war, uh, a war, another war crime. Horrifically, there's no evidence at all that that took place in that video with this group. But we, you know, we just don't know what was happening, what happened before and after the video, and the pressure for hostage release is increasing. Uh, the Poland Goldbergs were here with me yesterday. They had met with officials here. They met with the president Monday night. They met with members of Congress, and others did. But Netanyahu still is sticking to his goal of eliminating Hamas, even though two very prominent members of the War Cabinet, including his defense minister, say that's not possible. Where do you see the, the hostage talks, which are supposedly in pause, stalemated? It's it's not a happy situation, Andrea. The the outlook for a deal here, I think, is is bleak. It's it's hard for me to understand where the interests of Israel and Hamas can overlap in a way uh, where we can have an agreement that releases a substantial number of hostages. Um, maybe it's possible to do this incrementally and get some of the hostages out. But ultimately, the hostages are what are keeping the leader of Hamas, Yahya Sinwar, alive. Uh, and Netanyahu has vowed to uh, kill Sinwar and completely wipe out Hamas. And but the thing the one of the main obstacles that prevent him from doing that uh, is the fact that these hostages are there and the Israeli military has to pursue a strategy that battles Hamas while keeping the hostages alive. But when you ultimately go for it, you go for the leadership, you go for Sinwar, if they can figure out where he is and how to get at him. I don't see how they can do that uh, without harming the hostages. At the same time, 
Netanyahu has ruled out a permanent ceasefire and a withdrawal of Israeli forces. And that's the marker that uh, Sinwar has drawn as his condition for a major hostage release. And there's just not a lot of evidence he's going to budge from that. Unfortunately, I think Sinwar may believe that he's winning this conflict as Israel suffers more and more dipl diplomatic isolation around the world. So I have trouble understanding how a deal gets done and what it looks like. I wish it was a more optimistic forecast, but um, it's tough, especially when you see videos like that one.